Um, obviously, family perspective, have, okay. that theme has been woven through the whole day, as well it should be. And in, during you know, the next 45 minutes, uh, Sue Mistrat and Bill Klein uh, are going to talk some more about uh, the role of the family, the importance of the family. Uh, Sue Mistrat is a senior advisor to the Let's Participate Assistive Technology Model Demonstration Project, the one that we're doing in Massachusetts, thanks to Ron Benham, uh, who didn't tell the way we started that was I was giving him a ride back to the airport one year and said we were going after this particular grant and we were going to do it with the state and he said my state. I want my kids to have greater access to <coughs> AT. I want the cadre of people who understand AT to grow in my state to do it with my state and, and we made the deal on the way to the airport and it's been a really good one. So Sue, we, we did let's participate based on a model that Sue had developed, oh, probably 20 years ago? 90s. 50s. 90s. Yeah, a while. Two? Um, yeah. The Let's Play one Project when she was at the decade. University of <laughs> Buffalo. And so she will... Um, you know, I really can't say anything else. First of all, I didn't really say much about anybody else. So Sue, who is a good friend of mine, and we travel very close <coughs> together, and she knows more about beer than anyone <laughs> you will meet, bar none. <laughs> so, yes. I'm from Buffalo, so. Yes, yes. I, up, I do the scotch end, she does the beer end, and together we have very nice trips. So, okay. Sue, and then Bill has very kindly agreed to be available if he feels moved to say some more things, but also to be available for a few questions. <coughs> okay. Do I have a clicker? <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Do you see me? This guy? The one that didn't work for you? Uh -huh. Okay. No, we didn't. So, hello, everybody. It's, it's wonderful going last because all so much has been said ahead of time that I can just say, as you heard before, and as you heard before. But this is probably, I've been in this field, hmm, 1984, I think we had our first project. I'm an early educator by trade, and a knowledge of all things child by that. I have no formal training in disabilities, but I have spent the last 40 years working for what we used to call mainstreaming and now inclusive programming. And through this work, as the laws changed and our youngest population uh, began receiving mandated services across the United States, I really got my feet and body and head into the very, very youngest kids. And families, this is probably my favorite perspective because families have taught me so much about their kids. And the family perspective became very, very real to me 19 years ago when our first grandchild was born with pretty significant disabilities. And the young woman in the audience, Beth Poss, was his first speech therapist. And now he won't shut up. <laughs> so, he needed some of these supports for a while and then not so much. So now we have more behavioral things about stop already, that kind of thing. Anyhow, he's a wonderful kid. But families have a perspective. They are such an integral part of this whole system. They know things about kids that belong to them that people with 400 PhDs will never get. You need to use them as a resource. They will be able to tell you how to tweak that support so it absolutely works. What's important to them? Because if families don't find a support or intervention successful or something that they value, are they going to use it? I don't care how good it is. I don't care how, much, how many criteria check marks it gets. You need to have families in because they are 
the primary user of assistive technologies and any other intervention in the system. So it's incredibly, incredibly important to um, just really take a look at families and what, what they know. I'm sure when Bill and his wife found out that they were going to have two kids within months of each other, they knew this. They knew what their parent role was and they said, whoa, we better get going. So they started looking at what do we need to know about this. We need to have as much information as possible because they didn't have the luxury of going to the hospital, picking up the baby, and finding things out little by little. They had a done deal by two and three. A big start in saying, where do we go from here? So the first thing here, of course, is to find out, you know, what about that little guy? What about that person? What is he like? What, what are his challenges? What are his preferences? What turns him on? What makes him giggle? What is he, how does he like to be touched, et cetera, et cetera? So they had a steep learning curve right at the beginning. And one of the most exciting things about assistive technology for me is that the right assistive technologies help parents help kids. It's that simple. And that's what we're here to take a look at today. What the technologies I'm kind of taking a look at today or kind of focus on are those technologies that we would use with that very, very youngest group, the birth to two-year-old kids. We've heard a lot about screens today. We've heard a lot about preschool applications, all very important. But before you get there, you need to be able to start doing, and families need to feel just like this. They've got to do everything in their power to help that kid to provide encouragement to play the role of discoverer and explorer and play partner and all of those very wonderful things that are very, uh, very much the same to all families. As someone said earlier, all families want the same for their kids, right? They want them to be happy. They want them to have great relationships. They want them to have a good job. They want them to grow and develop and become everything they want to be. When you are a parent, who is not anticipated sometimes that your child will have a disability. Sometimes you need to get over that, but there are ways of helping, and I think one of the most exciting things when I first started off as an early intervention in Western New York, we had this fabulous woman who was a social worker by trade, and she was the head. And we had a lot of kids with um, cerebral palsy in particular, and she said, what do these families need? And of course, there was a lot of therapies and a lot of services, et cetera. And she said, no. She said, if I was that mom, I need to know how to touch that baby. I see these moms are afraid to touch the baby because they've heard all these medical terms and they don't want to hurt that little guy, right? She says, they all need to learn massage. So she brought in Western New York in 1982, she brought masseuses in and nurses to help families understand how much they can touch their baby, what the baby enjoys, look at how he's reacting, et cetera. So this, on this type of um, attitude is what, whoops, wrong way, <clears throat> we're going to take today. Early development, birth to five, we've been talking again a lot about the early learning. OSEP, um, has defined the purpose of assistive technology and other services and early intervention, which is birth through two years old, so they get their third birthday. Um, the purpose is not learning. The purpose is development. The job of that real little kid is not ABCs, one, two, threes, okay? Not sequence steps, but to develop. And so what we need to do here is to find out well, how do kids develop? And what they do, and again, here's the family at the center. They develop through the day-to-day -day repetition of what they do in families. What does the child's schedule look like? What does the family schedule? As practitioners and as administrators and as researchers, we've got to know this first. What are kids expected to do? What does the family look like? Are you going to get three families that are identical? This conversation has to happen immediately. What, what's happening in that family? Getting up, what's working? 
and what's not working so good or, you know, I mean, we've talked to many, many families where we would get, um, um, you know, lots of information. For example, our Tyler, our 19-year-old now, he had a PT coming in three times a week because he was in Montgomery County and that's what they did back then. And the therapist kept having him climb up the two stairs. And I remember Grandma was there visiting from Buffalo, and I said, can I talk to you? And she said, sure, why? Isn't he doing great? He's doing all this muscle stuff here. And I said, well, my daughter is really frustrated because he keeps sliding out of his high chair. The high chair, she had it reclined back, so it had some adjustability. But what was happening is this whole little low-tone body was going out and out and under. And I said, could you help her? She, this is really frustrating for her. And she said, oh my gosh, of course. And she took a phone book, flipped it backwards so you had an angle, slid that under him and said, there. Now, had she perhaps had a conversation about, how's, how's breakfast time going? You know, what's working for you? Is he feeding himself with his hands or whatever? What, what works for you? What's frustrating you? What's stopping him from doing more? And that's the conversation you need to have. Because my daughter left that food-loaded, turn-back telephone book in there for quite a long time. Okay? It worked. Then we found some of that rug mat and put that under. As his muscles developed, we changed it and changed it. So these everyday learning opportunities is, is absolutely the source of what families need, what are important to them, and what they value. These are some examples of kids participating. I had asked Bill earlier, I said, you know, we talked about the iPads and stuff. I said, did you ever call the pen to share some information that you had about what works at home with the teachers in the kids' school? Because remember, when, they, when you got them, they were two and three years old, so what, they probably started school pretty soon. Yeah, 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 the next fall. So could you share with them some of the things we were talking about earlier about some of the um, low-tech but very, very necessary uh, information that Bill shared with the teachers? Yeah, so, um, so having two kids with uh, physical uh, differences um, versus the class that they were going to be uh, attending um, made it a bit of a challenge because we didn't uh, have the ability to just change the entire classroom. Uh, reasonable accommodations in school is like, you know, waving a magic wand sometimes. It's the only way you'll uh, uh, have success. So we went in before uh, school started in the fall. We walked through each one of the classrooms and we assessed what we could make adjustments on uh, and take the adaptations that we had provided for our children and, frankly, for, for us in some instances, uh, at home and bring those to school. So uh, things like step stools, uh, extenders for light switches, uh, extenders for faucets, um, step stools in the bathroom for uh, 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 toileting, all those fun things uh, were things that we had uh, uh, brought in our resources, spent uh, a couple bucks on Amazon, I feel like I'm plugging all the dot coms today, um, and, uh, you know, uh, delivered them, hooked them up, and, uh, and on occasion replaced them. Um, but they were great resources for the kids, and it, it kind of evened the odds for us. Um, so um, in, in a way, we removed the obstacles that prevented our kids from being able to achieve whatever it is they wanted to achieve by virtue of something simple like a, a step stool or uh, a light extender. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier, too, that his kids were not the only kids in the class who benefited from this. Yeah, um, they didn't always use the equipment the right way, and I've replaced a couple of abusers, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we've, we've had some kids that uh, were on the uh, shorter end of uh, the uh, growth chart, and, um, but still within, I guess, average. Um, we call it average, not normal in our world. Mm -hmm. um, or I call all of you freakishly tall. Is, uh, <laughs> I look at. But um, but <laughs> but uh, we uh, we 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 definitely wanted to uh, to make sure that those resources were continually uh, available. And it turns out that other people needed them as well. Right. 
So it just makes a more accessible environment all the way around. So here, when kids participate, and we look and say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're in a school setting, right? And we know the schedule, and we know what happens in all these different areas. Well, look at what's happening in the different family settings. You've got to find this out. In fact, I know, I believe, Massachusetts, did you switch your IFSP over to the different scheduling areas of the day? In order to get that information during initial assessment and initial IFSP, um, how many other states use a what is the daily schedule in your home and what's working type of approach to early intervention? Okay, well this is something you may want to push and, and because it really does make sense. It gives you common language and common ground to work with families on. They've got those kids for three years before they get into the school system, and not all of them do. I believe, how much, what is it, 80-some percent of all services are provided in early event intervention in the home. So you need to understand what's going on here. So if you look at the family settings, and remember, you probably have uh, the house. You probably have the favorite playground. You might have grandma's house. You might have um, a, a neighbor's house, a library, et cetera. All of those are different settings. Within each one of those settings, there are different routines. Within the routines, there's activities. And within the activities, there's learning opportunities. So this is so rich. In fact, having a conversation, probably about one of them is going to take you one period of time there. But using that information to work together with the family to figure out what's important to them and what to work on is really critical. Now, of course, I couldn't let this go. There is participation in daily activities. And then there is a thing that makes the child a child, and that is play. Uh, I spent first my first 20 years working on play. How do you socialize? How do you use technology so children play with each other, that children build relationships and learn from play? So we know that play, and I'm talking unstructured, set it up so the kids can figure it out themselves. Not here's an app, and I'm not slamming apps, because I think apps have their role. But apps also should get a kid interested or reflect what they're doing in real world, not just in the 2D world. So, and kids are excited when they see things that are matched from real world to another. So we take a look at this little girl here. She's using, she's developing in all of her areas of development. She is going shopping in the house. She has already created her list. She has said to her mom, I'm going to get milk from the store. She found something appropriate to go shopping with. She is walking. She is moving. She is coming back and reporting and dispensing everything. She's imitating life. Cognitively, she, all systems are go here. She remembers what mom does, what she says. If you ever want to hear yourself reflected, listen to a two- or three-year-old. <laughs> Sometimes it isn't pretty. This needs to be embedded, incorporated. You need to focus and help families. So many families, what we hear from them is they're overwhelmed with the medical. For some reason, people need, think it perhaps is beneficial to say your child is at the age of an 18-month-old when he's two, three and a half. Somehow that helps. I never got that. But what we need to do is to create play scenarios, support children in doing it, and certainly I think a lot of us are very comfortable using object play, here's a toy, here's how we do it, etc. We can start working and thinking a little bit more and more about pretend play, which imitates life and uses language and movement and all of the things together and integrated is really, really critical. So. Okay, so what happens when a child has a disability and they are attempting to, to play, to get up in the morning and get dressed, to remember to go and get their toothbrush, to get their backpack packed, to come down and eat, etc. Disability gets in the way. It makes things harder. And what we're looking at is using assistive technologies to help families make it easier for kids. So looking even at the first picture, and this, this kind of piggybacks off of Bridget's wonderful, thank you Bridget, 1800 hole punch activity that she just shared with you, um, and saying, where, what's the AT in that picture? What thing, what item 
is being used by a child with a disability to allow them to do something that they can't do without it. In that first picture, what do you see? What is the assistive technology that is helping that little guy play? I'm sorry? Okay, the, why the chair? Because it's got a back on it? Okay, the, the seating where he is with the table in front of him too. Okay, the whole play environment, what's he holding? And the nubs on the ball is making this not only easier to feel, but it's waking up some of these things in his hands, because a lot of times a lot of kids don't feel a lot of this stuff, so you have to make it pop. And using that ball, does that help him to hang on to it? Does the design of that ball help him to hang on to it in order to play? Yes, that's assistive technology. How about this little princess? She's got her walker and she's got her smile, and I think I'd probably call the smile aid to you also. Okay, and then a light table. How many of you have seen preschools now with light tables? They become part of common equipment because not only kids who have visual impairments uh, benefit, but kids find them fascinating. And sometimes they can point out and match shapes and do whatever other playful things that they want with it with that. So it really helps kids to actively participate throughout um, the day. But these supports are absolutely critical, absolutely needed. Um, what, do, what do little ones do? I mean, it, all of these things. Assistive tech just helps kids do. And we have so often we'll be saying, well, you know, who's paying for that and where are you getting this? And a lot of it is what Suzanne was talking about earlier. Be a champion. Because you are not an AT specialist, you are a person who has been living and working with young children for how long, okay? You have tools in your tool, tool bags. You've got tricks. <laughs> Share them with families. Say, what do you think? How can we make that toy stay in place for that little guy? How about the Velcro? Magical stuff. How about the non-slip uh, mat again? Lots of those things. And if you don't have it, the toy slides away. If you do have it, the kid has an opportunity to in interact with it. What is it? Assistive technology. So what we have and what, what Bridget uh, pointed out very clearly was this range of AT sources. And when uh, Let's Play, which I did for about 20 years, the population we used were kids with low incidence, significant disabilities, et cetera, because they appear to have the highest needs, and their families have the highest need to allow play to happen. Not therapy, not goal work, but play for the simple joy of being, interacting, and making something happen. So that was what we were kind of focusing on. And then as we started looking at the benefits of AT, in inclusive environments where other kids were using things, we said, huh, it doesn't say only kids with significant disabilities can have AT, but it says any item that a child with a disability needs in order to do something you can't do without it. So we said, let's go back. All we have, all we got is this definition. <laughs> We, we don't have a whole lot more and some clarification from OSEP letters. But we've got the definition. So they tell us that you can get these items for any age person. You can go off the shelf. And we all know the explosion of universal design, right? I mean, items that were once found in the, what's it called, Salmon's Preston Catalog. Any of you old enough? To, okay, those curved handle spoons and the scoop bowls. You couldn't get those in Target. Well, Target wasn't invented. But you couldn't get those. You had to go to a specialty catalog because only kids with disabilities needed that, and they were only $15.95. Well, now you can get it at the grocery store checkout because developmentally, they work for a lot of kids at a certain developmental level to help them independently feed themselves. So because it's off the shelf at Target, does that make it not a T? Do you not recommend that to a family and only a universal cost because it's specialized? No. 
what's the family going to use? What's the family going to prefer to use? Is the stuff that looks like the same things that everybody else is using. So then we also have modified. This is all they tell us. You can get it off the shelf modified or customized. Okay, so there's some examples there. Let's take a little deep, deeper look. Here's your off the shelf uh, AT. It's readily available. So many smart, smart dot coms and vendors are doing, you know, like the big handled paintbrushes. Now, this is not rocket science. They take a look at a kid's hand. They say, huh, they, they can't use those long pointy things. They're going to poke themselves. Let's make something short. Let's make a book that's vinyl because you know how sticky kids are. But also those thick pages make it easier for kids to turn. And you can put photos of their own families in there and customize them that way. Okay? So you've got it. Um, the blocks. Again, just like that little tangy ball, the blocks are weighted and textured. So when a child goes to build A, it balances more successfully for him and he can feel it better. Why not? I can't tell you how many preschools I walk into in early child care centers. They're there because they're well designed and meet a wide range of developmental needs. There's your spoon. $2.95 now because they're mass marketed. Okay? Good old consumer tech. That screen made it in there. Uh, so that's definitely off the shelf AT. It's high end AT. Remember we used to talk low and high? Yeah, except how do you, what do you call an iPad? It's low end because it's consumable and everybody has access to it. And it's high end because it's high electronics. So we kind of made up that low, middle, high kind of tech because we didn't know what else. Stick with the definition. This fits. Did you have used anything that you see here, some off the shelfy stuff that, like when you went to get a bath seat, did you need anything special? Did you look for a feature that would hold your kids more secure? Or I don't know, did you have any issues with bath time to begin with? Um, not with bath time, but we, we bought a toilet seat um, that had a foot down smaller ring. Okay. So that uh, Zoe wouldn't uh, have to be uh, taking a bath and yeah, it's falling there. through. It's a scary feeling. Very Small hiney. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then we took the whole toilet out, and I bought uh, a low toilet because um, uh, both of my kids were climbing uh, up on the step stool and then climbing onto the toilet and walking around the seat and then sitting down. And, great uh, balance. Great balance <laughs> un until they whack their head and we're in the ER, in which case that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why I replaced the toilet. Um, so we did that. Um, we use the paint brushes that you have there in the picture um, because my kids both have uh, another one of the awesome traits of being a little person is the uh, stubby fingers and so uh, you know uh, grasping uh, objects was a little bit more difficult those uh, gave a little bit more to, uh, to hold on to um, the spoons yep we use those and the blocks we use those the iPad I know you love the iPad we love iPads in our house. Yeah, we have and, and they are. Yeah. They have, but I've also seen enough of your TV that I see you pull them up at the table, and there's crayons, and there's oh, art, yeah. lots of art stuff. I mean, again, you're not saying either or, right? Yeah, no, no, no. We, 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 we give the chance uh, for the kids to make the decision, and then, uh, of course, on occasion, we have to pull them back on the on the screen time stuff. Yeah, because that's so. when their brain gets sucked out. I have a five-year-old who said... <laughs> I think I have to turn it out. It sucked my brain, I said. It did. I mean, engagement is wonderful, right? But after, I don't know, depending on the kid, keep an eye on it because you need to put that timer on. And did you know that's built into your Apple system where you can put the timer on and when it the kid doesn't know it's on, the app turns off? Yeah, it's in there under the clock or something like that. And when, I think it's timer, and it says, what do you want to happen, an alarm? And go all the way to the bottom, it says, stop app. So anyway, little in case anybody's in control like I am. Okay, now they're adaptable. This is a, a grand, grandchild number eight. So and her mom is an SIOT, sensory integration OT, so she gets it. So anyhow, we look for toys that will grow with kids. I think everybody, and again, this is information to share with families, right? I mean, we've also had kids who are three, but are at the same perhaps motor developmental level, 
And so they need some support, and yet they need to do something that's fun and interesting and that they like to do. So when she was little, she's in her little bumpo. I think she's about six, seven months old there. This was real, really photo op. I said, you're really not going to make her sit in that long, are you? And we took two legs off and tilted it towards her so her random movements would make something happen. Then she starts crawling. She can come up to it by herself, and then she's standing. That's the same toy, just used developmentally across different stages for probably a year. Okay? Good shopping tips. Modified. I mean, there's our Velcro, right? There's our confining a toy so it doesn't get out of sight. Very frustrating for a kid who can't follow it and yet likes to make things go. Switch toys can be used not just to causality. No, make it stop, make it go. That is so boring, that puts kids to sleep within five minutes. But if you create a play scenario that that bear is going to knock down your brother's blocks, oh, you've got engagement. But when we were showing families very often, and do you want to try the switch toy, they would kind of look at you and say, that doesn't look like what my other kids used. That doesn't look like what the neighbors used. But, you, but we would say, well, it's an option. You, you know, pick what you want. So we would come back, and the parents might say, you know, I think you might be ready for that button toy you had. So bring it out. So a lot of times it's exposure, giving people new ideas about what they might be able to do. Again, our tri-wall up, which was mentioned before, to um, get things going. Picture choices at breakfast. Yeah, you can go through the cupboard and bring the whole cupboard out, but sometimes it's also a developmental thing to say you, can, you know that that's the picture of the Cheerios. It doesn't have to be the whole box. We're going from 3D to 2D. So these are modified everyday things. The iPad is modified for switch use. Somebody had called in and had asked about uh, using communication devices. Well, sometimes people can't point. So you can use uh, row column scanning, and that is built into the operating system of the iOS. You don't have to do anything fancy. It's built in. You need to get a switch. Okay, homemade. I bet you are the master of some of this stuff. Uh, no. No? no? Yeah. Your wife? No? No uh, one made did the whole... Who, who did homemade? that adapter on the faucet? Uh, Amazon. Uh, <laughs> they take over everything, don't they? Yeah, no. It's a little <laughs> duck that has a clamp on it, and it's very cute. And, yeah. Oh, I, okay. So there, there are... They, they're looking at a market here. Okay, that beautiful <laughs> child in, behind the red cart is Tyler at three. Two and a half or three. He didn't walk for quite a while. So anyhow, it was very important to mom and dad to get him up. He's two and a half. He's got a little sister now, okay? So how do we get Tyler up in the house? And mom and dad were not ready for walkers, gate trainers, whatever we call all of those things. And besides, everyone was convinced that this kid would eventually walk, okay? So what they did is they found, they had to find a cart that was tall enough, because he was a pretty tall kid, he's not like one, and stable enough. But the stability piece, because kids tend to lean on it, <clears throat> as opposed to just walking with it. I mean, any little one starting to walk is going to do the same thing. So, maybe hard to see, but see those gray wheels? They have white around them. That's Velcro. <laughs> so when it got on that cover, then that carpet, he had to push. He had to use all those little tone, low tone muscles, and he had to push it. So pushing is different, <coughs> but it gave him the stability to move. Then his dad eventually took like the uh, two of them off, maybe off the back or off the front, took some of the Velcro off. So he was doing more independent walking and less pushing, but still felt stable. And he could also play with his sister because the cart can be a million different things when you're playing. Okay. So, homemade, yes. AT, yes, absolutely. Did he need it forever? Did he go into adulthood with it? No. But you know what? In early intervention, that's the good news. We don't want stuff that's going to stay with those kids forever. We want kids to move through and develop. How about this one over here? I love this one. It's the Xerox box. It could have been an Amazon.com box. And the therapist always like those little feet, you know, going like this and flat on the floor. Well, he was dangling on that chair. I can use that Xerox box See? Now. Yeah, there you go. And you just put the holes of the chair 
in it and hope you got it. <laughs> Something yeah. to think about. But we do say parents are engineers and magicians. They know their kids. They know what works. Customized AT, lots of it out there. I think we're starting to see some of it less and less. Now, it still is there, and for kids who need it, that this will give them independence in participation in learning and developing, absolutely. I am not suggesting that you don't consider these things. However, over 90% of families, when given choices between high-end and off-the-shelf modified, pick off-the-shelf modified. Why? Because it looks normal. It looks average. It what, it's what every, but all the other families down the street. They typically get their information about what AT is best from their families and friends because us practitioners tend to push the high-end stuff. But it's not typically being, now this isn't for everybody. You've got kids who need an augmentative communication device, absolutely. But starting off with the family, rather have something that you touch on an iPad that still looks like an iPad or something else, okay? So consider widely. Consider widely for your families. This would be a range. My kid likes to play bubbles. And you can take it all the way through, off the shelf, modified, or customized. And you can find stuff. Let the family decide. We've also heard from families that the high-end stuff tends to isolate their kid. And Pip Campbell, an old friend, said, yes, AT can be the badge of disability as you're coming in with your wheelchair and all of this kind of stuff. So be careful. Their kids first, families first. Okay. So anyhow, family role as decision maker. How could you possibly make a decision of what's going to work without the family? The family knows the kid. The family knows their schedule. The family knows who's in the schedule, the activity level, et cetera, et cetera. The family knows the family's needs. You've got to get it from the family. <laughs> the AT has to fit. It can't take too much training. It can't take too much fuss or muss. It has to fit the activity level, the context, the people who are there, et cetera. They need to be part of this assessment and trial. They need to say, this is where my challenge is. Give me some ideas and solutions. Work together on that and try things out. They then evaluate what is working and what isn't. And this is when AT is used most effectively and most efficiently, when families use it and evaluate its value and importance for the development of their child, because we can go back to what, what the role of parents are. So families have to value it. They need information. They need everybody's information about what might work. Uh, they do prefer the low end if possible, and it's got to be easy to, use, easy to use and adapted across environments so you can embed it more easily. And they do need access to AT lending libraries and areas where you can get this stuff. Most of these little ones won't use it long and will turn it over to other kids. For our preschool kids in Massachusetts, what we found is that teachers who find, teachers act like families then, what they find works best for most of their kids, they add it to their classroom list for purchase. Again, these one by ones are, don't tend to be happening because of budget restraints and inclusion uh, concepts. So anyway, basically, assistive tech makes things possible and let families help their kids. And that's our little go boy, the one that uh, uh, Suzanne was talking about, go baby go. He's the third one in there. So did you want to add anything? No, I think <laughs> you got told it. You I, talked about it. <coughs> I think you got it pretty okay. good. Thank you, everybody. This was a wonderful day, very informative for <laughs> all of us. Um, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good question. Ross, do you, I'm, Ross is, he's done library and connections for, for Tech Act. Yeah, check your Tech Act. Oh, there is a great website that you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you. 
It's, is it the reuse one? Hold on. We got an answer here. Okay. Okay. Okay, so are they all through the Tech Act or are there separate funding besides the Tech Act? Okay. They don't know about them, yeah. ATAP. Okay, so is that kind of a clearinghouse for what's happening? That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Two o'clock and then go. Okay. Again, yeah, thank I'm always being No, it's not on. Patrick? Yeah. Patrick? Can you, there we go. Oh, okay. So thank you all for staying with us, for making the effort, for contributing your attention um, and your, 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 your enthusiasm. Thank you for what you do every day on behalf of children with disabilities without disabilities or at risk of developing them and I'd like to thank again our all of our panelists today who just did a super job as well as Bridget Gillermini who did a great job with the hands-on uh, activities so now clap please <laughs> And I want to again thank our, our funders at the uh, Department of Education and our great uh, program officers, Carmen Sanchez and Terry Jackson. And last, I want to give a shout out to the FHI 360 staff who work on the Center on Technology and Disability who have been working very, very hard to put this together today. And that includes Amy Deachin, who you've seen taking questions, um, Anna Maria Gutierrez, who has been sending you all these great emails about logistics and getting making sure everybody's registered, Nolan Simon, who is the best tech support guy on earth, and uh, Jackie Marias, who has, uh, is an AT specialist, who has provided a lot of content and support, um, Jan Archer, who's not with us, but it's made sure that, um, that a lot of the behind the scenes things that needed to get done did. And um, is that it? Am I missing anybody? Uh, Bridget, thank your staff at PACER for everything they did. And we'll let you all 
go home, and I hope that you'll uh, come to the CTD website often. We have lots of great webinars. We have targeted technical assistance that you from your school systems can uh, come and uh, work out something with us where we'll do some specific activities with you and for you. Um, so again, please, please stay in touch. You can send questions. I know we have got contact information in your packets. My cards are out there. Please feel free to call or write at any time. So have a great rest of the day, everybody.